Listening test instructions. The listening test is about 50 minutes. There are six parts in listening test. You will have about six minutes to listen to each passage and answer the questions. The passage will be played once. I'm so sorry. I really don't know what to say. I don't know where it could be. Could you please look again? I really like that coat. Question 1. What is the closest meaning of man saying? You will hear a conversation in three sections. You will hear each section only once. After each section, you will hear two or three questions. You will hear the questions only once. Choose the best answer to each question. Hello, Mr. Adler. You asked me to come over? Yes, thanks. Please come in. What seems to be the problem? Well, I know it's sunny outside, but inside it's so cold. I have both heaters turned on, but I'm still freezing. The house is small, and I thought it would be easy to heat, but I see now, the, see now that the ceilings are high. I turned the ceiling fan on to push the hot air down, but it's pulling the hot air up. I can't figure out how to make it change direction. You can't. The fan is only for the summer, but this cold weather is very unusual. Normally, it's warmer than this. Do you know how long, long it will last? They say only for a few days. Unfortunately, they're calling for rain after that. But I can have some firewood delivered if you'd like. Um, could you show me how to use the wood stove first? Of course. Okay, then. Yes, I'd like some firewood delivered. All right, but it probably won't get here until tomorrow. In the meantime, I'll bring over another heater for you. Question 1. What is the man's main complaint? Question 2. Which word best describes the woman? Question 3. What is the weather normally like? You will hear the second section of the conversation shortly. Hello? Oh, come in. Here's the extra heater. Where would you like it? Right here in the living room is perfect. In the corner so I don't trip over it. Okay. This is the button to turn it on. And this... Is the button to turn it off. Yes, yes. And I see that I can set the temperature, and then it will shut off, shut off by itself, right? Yes. Afterwards, when you don't need it anymore, just put it away in the closet or something. It'll be good to have an extra heater here. Okay. And thanks for bringing it over so quickly.
Question 4. What should the man do with the heater later? Question 5. What is likely true of the man? Question 6. What is likely true of the woman? You will hear the third section of the conversation shortly. The wood has been delivered, I see. Yes, thank you. I asked them to stack it near the door. Good. Okay, now before you light the fire, slide the damper, this handle, to the right to open the chimney. Otherwise, the house will fill with smoke. Like this? No. To the right. To the right. Ah, and then I put some wood in the stove. No. First, crumple up some newspaper. Next, you put in some small pieces of wood, and then you light it. Once there is a nice, small fire, you can put in bigger pieces of wood, one at a time, carefully. Make sure you always close the door, though. And when the fire is completely out, I turn the handle to close the chimney? To the left? Yes. But just in case, I'll come back later. Question 7. What is the purpose of the woman's visit? Question 8. Why does the woman say, I'll come back later? You will hear a conversation followed by five questions. Listen to each question. You will hear the question only once. Choose the best answer to each question. Hello everybody and welcome back to a thrilling game at the Tokyo Dome with the U.S. team taking a drumming at the hands of the Japanese national team going into the second half 51-26. The U.S. Dream Team is made up of NBA veterans, supposedly the best we have to offer, but they need a mirror to dig themselves out of a hole and come back at this point. Unfortunately for the Dream Team, their leading scorer, High Fly Wilson, was ejected one minute into the second quarter after climbing into the stands and fighting with a spectator who had continually heckled Wilson for shooting three air balls in a row. Another bizarre moment, bizarre moment came late in the second quarter when the Japanese center Tomohiro Suzuki suffered a concussion and was knocked out cold as he lunged for a ball and collided with the knee of one of his own teammates. There also have been several other injuries including the loss of starting forward Masa Harara.
Some of the coaches on the U.S. team are attributing the team's sluggish performance to some raw fish they had last night while attending a banquet in their honor. Next thing we'll know it, they'll be blaming their players' cement hands on a demonstration class on Japanese paper folding earlier this week. Who knows what'll be next? Okay, it looks like we're ready for the second half. How is the U.S. Dream Team doing in the game? The dream team is made up of What is the Dream Team's leading score? The Japanese center injured his. The dream team did poorly because they You will hear a conversation followed by six questions. Listen to each question. You will hear the question only once. Choose the best answer to each question. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 7 in a series of 12 on the island nations of the Pacific Ocean. Today we will be talking about Vanuatu. Vanuatu is a group of about 15 islands divided into six provinces, which can be found around 1,700 kilometers from the eastern coast of Australia. Its capital city is called Port Vila, which has a population of more or less 30,000. The total population in Vanuatu is some 200,000. Now I first want to say some brief words about the history and politics of the island, and then we can talk about its culture and geography. Many of the islands of Vanuatu have been inhabited for thousands of years. The oldest archaeological evidence found dating to 2000 BC. In 1605, the Portuguese explorer Pedro Fernandes de Quiros became the first European to reach the islands, believing it to be part of Terra Australis. Europeans began settling the islands in the late 18th century after British explorer James Cook visited the islands on a second voyage and gave them the name New Hebrides. In 1887, the islands began to be administered by a French-British naval commission. In 1906, the French and British agreed to joint Anglo-French rule over the New Hebrides. Vanuatu suffered from a practice wherein half of the adult male population of some of the islands became indentured workers in Australia. Because of introduced diseases, the population fell greatly to 45,000 in 1935. During World War II, two of the islands were used as allied military bases. 
In the 1960s, the Vanuatu people started to press for self-governance and later independence. Full sovereignty was finally granted by both European nations on July 30, 1980. It joined the UN in 1981 and the non-aligned movement in 1983. During the 1990s, Vanuatu experienced political instability, which eventually resulted in a more decentralized government. The Vanuatu Mobile Force, a paramilitary group, attempted a coup in 1996 because of a pay dispute. There were allegations of corruption in the government. New elections were called several times after 1997. As far as the economy goes, it is based primarily on agriculture, which provides a living for 65% of the population. Fishing, offshore financial services, and tourism are the other main supporters of the economy. About 50,000 tourists visit the island group annually. Mineral deposits are negligible, and the country has no known petroleum deposits. Economic development is hindered by dependence on relatively few commodity exports, vulnerability to natural disasters, and long distances from main markets and between constituent islands. GDP growth rose less than 3% on average in the 1990s. In response to foreign concerns, the government has promised to tighten regulation of its offshore financial center. In mid-2002, the government also stepped up efforts to boost tourism. There are three official languages, English, French, and Bislama, which is a Creole language which evolved from English. In addition, over 100 local languages are spoken on the islands. The density of languages per capita is the highest of any nation in the world, with an average of only 2,000 speakers per language. Most of the islands are mountainous and of volcanic origin, and have a tropical or subtropical climate. The highest point in Vanuatu is Mount Tabu Masana, at 1,879 meters. There are several active volcanoes in Vanuatu, including Lopavi, as well as several underwater ones. A severe earthquake in November 1999, followed by a tsunami, caused extensive damage to the northern island of Pentecote, leaving thousands homeless. Another powerful earthquake in January 2002 caused extensive damage in the capital, Port Vila, and surrounding areas, and also was followed by a tsunami. The future for Vanuatu is very uncertain. Global warming and the threat of rising sea levels puts this group of islands in imminent danger. Much of the Vanuatu landmass lies just a few feet above the waves. If sea levels do continue to rise at current rates, the inhabitants of Vanuatu may be seeking refuge in New Zealand or Australia before the end of the century. According to the speaker, Vanuatu is a group of A Portuguese explorer, Pedro Fernandes de Quiros was. The speaker says that the island started to be operated by The speaker says, in 1935, the population fell drastically due to
According to the speaker, full authority was officially granted by The speaker says, new elections were called due to allegations of You will hear a news item once. It is about 1.5 minutes long. Then five questions will appear. Choose the best way to complete each statement from the drop-down menu. Hi, this is Larry Watson here with the evening sports news. In tennis, the Brazilian Diego Garcia reached the semi-finals of the French Open. The 26-year-old from Sao Paulo, knocked out in the first round last year in Paris, managed to overcome the Swiss player Heinz Gruhler in four sets. Garcia said he was delighted with his victory and put it down to having changed his coach last winter. The two Americans, Rod Langer and Brad Wilson, will play in the second semi-final tomorrow to decide who will play Garcia. We stay in France, where today, the fifth stage of the Tour de France took place. The 74 cyclists have already entered the mountains, and the Italian Gianfranco Baresi took first place after a long, steep climb up to finishing line after 184 miles in the hot sun. Baresi now leads the Tour by over six minutes and it will take something special to take the yellow jersey off him. Golf. And today was the first day's play in the IBM Open in Tennessee. Stormy weather played its part, and the players didn't tee off until around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Once play did get underway, the Australian, Mark Chappell, played some superb shots and finished the day on 5 under par 67, two shots clear of Mark McConaughey from Scotland and the local boy, Chav Connor. Shot of the day, however, went to the unknown Canadian, Ross Werther, who made an unbelievable hole-in-one on the short twelfth hole. Werther held his head in his hands as his wayward shot seemed to be heading for the lake, but it miraculously hit a wooden post, bounced back onto the green and into the hole, to the delight of the capacity crowd. In Tokyo today, the final qualification for tomorrow's Japanese Grand Prix took place in rainy conditions. Gert Kruger, driving for Ferrari, finished the day in pole position and looks in a great position to consolidate his lead in the World Championship standings. The Jaguar driver, Eddie Cochran, was the early leader in the qualifying sessions, held in heavy rain and gusting winds, but Kruger showed his best form as the racetrack dried out a little later on. Finally, tonight's baseball scores. Pittsburgh were beaten 10-2 by a strong Milwaukee side. Boston overcame the Yankees by 7-3. The Chicago White Sox shaded a close game 4-3 against Cleveland. Tampa Bay came out on top 8-5 in Toronto and Houston saw off St. Louis by 4-1. to one. That concludes this evening's Sports Roundup. My name is Larry Watson, and I'll be back at midnight.
You will listen to a two minutes video. Then eight questions appear. Choose the best way to answer each question. Working with a group of people can bring up all sorts of issues. Now, a new survey shows the top cause of stress at work is, quote, unclear goals. The internet site Comparably says that is followed by workers' commute, a bad manager, difficult co workers, and too long hours. So they surveyed 88,000 people in tech companies. So this is a little bit specialized, but there's a ton of different departments sure, in tech companies sure. HR, communications, legal, all that stuff. Um, Allie, is this surprising at all? I, I feel like I wouldn't have gotten to unclear goals in my top five. I wouldn't either, and I look at that number and it's 42% say unclear goals is a big cause of stress. But you think about it, maybe it's the shift in millennials in the workplace and millennials want more feedback. They wanna have a better relationship with their supervisor, whether it's a manager or their direct report. And you can see how maybe that's something that the younger generation thinks is important. Yeah, I just wanna, I guess you wanna know what your purpose is. You wanna be able to check things off and say, hey, I've achieved this. Jason, you look skeptical. I mean, isn't your goal to like do your job? Well, if you don't know exactly what that, that job what is, or does it mean I don't like whatever my goal is, or I think I'm more important than whatever the goal is that they're giving cynical. me? Well, I think it's understandable if it's there. To me, like what that really gets at is either employees who haven't figured out what they want to do, which mm -hmm. I think is very common, right? A lot of us, you're like, is this is this exactly where I want to be? What is my goal? Choice. What do I right. want to do? Or it's management that hasn't really engaged on that, where the management has that attitude of like, well, your job is to, you're a level C uh, accountant, like just do that. Yeah, like, yeah, what do, do you mean? What goal do you need? Crunch the numbers, man. Right, uh, Ali. The other thing that's uh, stuck uh, stuck out to me in this: twenty one percent of the people surveyed here have unlimited vacation time. And who are you? And where do I find you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. But these same people are also saying they're not taking vacation. Because no. when they go on vacation, they're still expected to be in office mode. Well, I think that I know a lot of people who work for companies like this, where yeah. they do get unlimited vacation. And what happens is you're expected to respond to email, respond to phone calls. When you do go on vacation, you're constantly kind of working in the morning and at night. You just never turn anything off. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Unlimited vacation is kind of the least you can get when you're essentially working 16, 17 right. hours Like days. Uber unlimited vacation. I have a friend who worked for Uber. She was working 100 hours a week. She no longer works there because she was working so much. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's not unlimited if you can't take yes. it. No. Yeah. You don't have time. All right.
you will hear a report once. It is about three minutes long. Then six questions will appear. Choose the best way to answer each question from the drop-down menu. Welcome to Motoring Week. My name is Beth Williams, and we have a full program for you this afternoon. Later on, we'll be taking a look at the very latest arrivals on the in-car satellite navigation market and talking exclusively to the head of mechanics in the Ferrari Formula One team. But first, today, we will be speaking about the phenomenon that has, at some time or other, affected us all. Road rage. You know the deal. Some reckless, thoughtless motorist cuts in front of you on the highway or pulls out without looking, and all of a sudden, the red mist descends and we seem to lose control of our thoughts and actions. Neil Adamson from the Northwest Motoring Association is here to speak to us today about road rage in general, but in particular about a survey his organization has just carried out. Neil, welcome to the show. Hi, Beth. First off, I have to ask you, do you ever feel road rage when you are out driving? <laughs> no, I don't. Thankfully, I managed to keep control of myself while behind the wheel, although our survey's findings show that many of the motorists we encounter on the roads are only one minor accident away from losing their cool. Right. Tell us something about your findings, Neil. We asked the question, have you ever felt like getting out of your car and confronting a driver you consider to be at fault for an accident or traffic incident? We were astonished to find that some 68% answered in the affirmative and some 23% actually had left their vehicle for some incident or another. Wow, those figures are high. There's clearly a lot of risk involved in acting like that, wouldn't you say? Let's put it this way. Every year, some 40,000 motorists die on American roads. We have estimated that somewhere between one-half and two-thirds of those deaths occur in accidents which have some element of aggressive driving involved. It's been calculated that as many as one-third of these aggressive driving-related accidents involve a motor vehicle being used deliberately as a weapon. So the definition of road rage goes beyond what a lot of our listeners might assume. That is, for drivers to get angry at the maneuvers of another motorist and to physically confront them outside the vehicle. Road rage clearly involves that type of incident. Only last week in L.A., a father of three was shot when he left his vehicle to remonstrate with a motorist who had changed lanes carelessly and almost caused a collision. You'll find people are more and more wary of leaving their vehicles. People are quite often so afraid of road rage, carjacking and so on, that they lock themselves in their vehicles and nothing will convince them to leave. But, and here's the big but, road rage also includes staying in your vehicle but using it as a weapon against someone you consider to have slighted you in whatever way. Most of the road rage incidents we have looked into have involved motorists aggressively pursuing other cars with their own and often smashing into them to drive them off the road or just get a little bit of revenge for a perceived insult. The situation is getting out of control. What do you think is contributing to this problem, Neil? Are people just becoming more aggressive and ruder in their everyday dealings with other people on the streets? When I knew you were coming on the show to speak to us about this problem, I asked my father if he could remember incidents similar to the modern phenomenon of road rage, and he said you wouldn't get much more than someone honking the horn loudly. We seem to have taken it all to another new dangerous level. I think there are a lot of socio-economic reasons behind this huge increase in aggressive driving behaviour we're seeing. Here is one statistic you might find interesting. In the last 20 years or so, the number of miles of American highways has increased something like 1%, which is, of course, a tiny amount. However, in the same time period, there's been something like a whopping 40% increase in vehicle numbers. And I suppose the result of that is even greater competition for physical space on the roads and a consequent rise in stress levels among drivers. Absolutely. Our roads are getting clogged up to an ever-increasing extent. Travel times are taking longer, and people are sitting in near-stationary vehicles, getting very hot and bothered. 
This not only means people are more likely to react in a negative way when confronted by what is perceived to be inconsiderate other drivers, but it also means that, given 50 yards of clear road, drivers are more likely to cut in front of others, run red lights and so on, in an effort to make up for lost time in a way. That doesn't make it something we can condone but it does help us to try and understand some of the motives that lie behind this trend. What can be done in the way of driver education to try and combat this problem, Neil? My own son is attending driver's ed at high school at the moment, and I have to say that the amount of time being devoted to this particular problem is minimal. You're right. This whole issue has to be taken into the public education system, but we also need constant education through the medium of police warnings or TV and radio messages. People have to understand that using one ton of steel automobile as a weapon, especially at high speeds, can have absolutely catastrophic results. Let me tell you about one tragic case. I spent last Tuesday with a very polite, soft-spoken young man up in Oregon State Penitentiary who's currently serving a 74-year sentence for five counts of third-degree murder. He had been waiting at a red light when a mother with her four daughters pulled up in front of him in a large off-road vehicle. Now, this guy was pretty ticked off that she hadn't waited behind him. It's a situation I see from my downtown office window 50 times a day, and this story goes to show what can result when tempers are short and nerves are frayed. So the guy chases the mom and her kids and ends up pushing them off the road where unfortunately they crashed through a row of trees and into a river some 60 feet below the road. My word, that's just awful. Well, yes it is. Unforeseen consequences is an expression I've heard more times than I can tell you. A car travelling at 60 miles per hour will impart a huge amount of force, and these unforeseen circumstances do happen very often. Now this prisoner's life has been destroyed, and he told me last week, to mention his case on this afternoon's show. I suppose to try and illustrate how ten seconds of road rage can destroy lives all round, not only those of the victims in the car, but also that of the perpetrator. Neil, what advice could you give to our listeners? We've just had an email from Hank in Sacramento saying he had a guy pull a knife on him this morning when he gestured to get out of his car at a stop sign. The world's gone nuts, is his final thought on the matter. We have to make allowances. We live in such a rushed world that we're asking for problems if we always leave for work at the last possible moment. I give myself 20 minutes for a drive that usually takes 10. If I arrive 10 minutes early, I go and get a coffee in the restaurant across the street. If we continue to live our lives right at the limit, then when things go a little awry, which of course they do, then we find ourselves getting frustrated and likely to release that fury on the first person to cross us. In your father's day, people also drove badly, but I just don't think there was this fuel of anger ready to fan the flames. Neil Adamson from the Northwest Motoring Association, thanks for joining us today. If any of our listeners would like further information about this really important issue, contact us and we'll send you our information packet for today's program.